Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Rob Pavarian and this is Victoria 3's Japan AAR. Today we will take a look at the second part of it, or at least what I see as the second part. We will continue onwards from a point of view I think that is uh, quite enthusiastic, that is quite optimistic when it comes to the future of the country. We're looking at the Komei restoration, it has been done, the Shogunate is no more and the Emperor is in control. However, the Komei restoration still needs several steps. We need to oust certain old powers, we need to change things. And I would like to discuss this part because we're looking at a playthrough that of course is fairly old, you can see it happened in May, meaning that since then I assume many things changed, for example trade of course got reworked, tariffs, taxes and so on, but nonetheless what we can learn here are some things for interest groups, for I think characters and for everything going on in the political landscape regardless of Japan. So basically we have a very interesting uh, case study right here from which we can learn a lot as far as Victoria 3 is concerned and I think we should, uh, should simply jump in. All right, let's get back to it then. It's 1853. The emperor has been restored to power and the shogunate is no more. The samurai have fallen, replaced by a modern professional army. This was step one out of three for the full Komei restoration. And we are slowly industrializing. Have you begun colonizing Sakhalin in any way? No, colonization for now is not possible, but we will certainly get around to it. Do we even have a colonial institution? Remember, you get the tech, of course, you know, tech that lets you go further and further. I believe uh, malaria is something that generally will restrict you, as it did historically. But you also need the institution. It comes in different flavors, and it makes it so that you need to have administrative capacity invested in it if you actually want to colonize as is. Currently, we do not have a colonial institution. I think what I want to do first here is identify industries ripe for privatization. He's doing this so that he can build up a very strong faction when it comes to the industrialists, for example, when it comes to the intelligentsia, so that he can move those industries into a power base, into a pop base that he actually is favorable of, instead of, for example, the landowners or even the monks. Then we have Wrench saying Fallen Eagle. That is a very important part of the entire text. Fallen Eagle is a CK3 mod, you should go check it out. These furniture manufacturers, for example, now under new capitalist management. Now, in the last video, we discussed exactly how that works, how you get them to be under different management. And the answer is that to get an advanced form of investment, which this is, this is, I believe, a... Public, uh, publicly traded, which just means that capitalists basically move in. Uh, to do this, you need an advanced form of production methods, because these production methods then imply that you need more capital, that you need richer individuals that are more focused on actually getting this going, rather than being a manager owner, you just become the owner and let other people manage it. In this case, then the capitalists simply benefiting from it. And this, of course, strengthening the industrialists. So this is the furniture manufacturers right here in Shubu are actually working outstandingly to get the old guard out of politics and get the new guard in. Uh, number 76 out of how many? Um, 76 at least. Um, I think they say it here somewhere. No, apparently they don't. We also ought to make some changes to the paper industry. I can't privatize paper because I'd need to advance to a PM that requires sulfur and I'm not making any of that sulfur. So it could change it, but those buildings then would have absolutely no output. They would have no benefits and they would probably shut down. Instead, he will be building a few mines. I assume sulfur mines. The mines mine different things based on where they are built or are they specific to something. Specific mines for each resource. So I assume again that he He's building the sulfur mines. Oh, and people want more tea. What are we, British? We're, uh, we're killing so many whales that meat is finally affordable. So this is of course beneficial if he wants to build a bit of a middle class. Now that they can actually afford this, they will be much more, uh, 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 you know, basically stable when it comes to their income situation, making it so that they can from there then pick up even more job opportunities, because that does feature in it. This has been such a long time ago, but if you recall the uh, dev and qualifications, that is basically how it works. The better you are off, the higher will your literacy be. The higher your literacy is, the higher will it be the chance that you can actually pick up a different qualification It will build up over time. So this is a good step to build basically a bit of a middle class if you make it cheaper for them to be middle class. Now I'm privatizing the coal mines as well, so these are actually coal mines, here you go. They make a lot less money as a result for several reasons. Capitalists take a higher wage than shopkeepers, more input goods needed for atmospheric engine-based mining, more machinists and engineers versus laborers who are also taken a higher wage. And of course, high coal output reduces the price of coal. Yeah, this makes perfect sense. You see the entire machinery, the entire economic machinery in action here. This just means that now you need to use the coal in more places. That is ultimately how industrialization works to begin with anyway. On the other hand, more capitalists means more industrialist power, cheaper coal, other industries benefit, and the pops employed are richer. Uh, who cares about the common man? More power to the proto-zaibatsus. 
An emerging capitalist class seems like a mixed blessing. What I'm saying here is that pure profitability isn't the most important thing to optimize when you're micromanaging your economy. And I would like to take a moment here to actually point out that this very sentence here, in my opinion, is the reason that I don't see, and I, I will be happily surprised, but I don't see any way in which the UI and the UX in Victoria 3 couldn't be confusing no matter what. Because you see right here, normally in any video game, if you play, for example, CK3, if you play EU4, if you play Hoi4, it will say you get more of this if you build this. Let's go, right? But in reality, you might be looking at the people that will then be working in these locations and say, I prefer having the machinists and engineers instead of the laborers because they tend to go into IGs that I like. You might say the shopkeepers going out means that largely the petite bourgeoisie may suffer, meaning the industrialists will benefit, which is exactly what I want, even if ultimately that building makes less money, even if ultimately many, many other pops are just worth less. Uh, this is a very interesting angle because you can't really capture that in a UI. Um... I hope that they can fix it up as much as they can, but this very problem, in my opinion, is ultimately why Victoria 3 can do whatever it wants and it will still oftentimes run into an issue where you want to achieve something that the UI straight up can't capture because it is just too hidden under three layers because, you know, if you build up the coal, that means ultimately you might make cars cheaper and the industrialists, they're richer, which is what you wanted, but the coal in itself will suffer, right? There's so many angles here to take that a UX simply can't capture. And just to put that into perspective, I think this will be one of the main issues when it comes to the entry hurdles for Victoria 3. Let's hope that they can still dress it up as nicely as possible. Does changing the PM also reduce the amount of workers in total? Sometimes it does. In this particular case, it actually increased the number of workers meaning an overall increase in state a standard of living in the state because more people are of course employed in a very profitable building looking at more advanced base mining pms once you switch away from picks and shovels the number of workers remains consistent however there are other pm categories that will affect workforce differently for instance using steam donkeys would drastically reduce the required workforce right interesting maybe hold off on steam donkeys until you have all the peasants working right now i generally want to increase the amount of people employed in buildings rather than subsistence farms because this way they get out of the rural folk faction and go into the faction that you want them in. I, I love the, the intertwined nature. You have this in no other game. In EO4, for example, and EO4 is a very harsh example because it's very board gaming and it wants to be very board gaming, but in EO4, most of the affairs, for example, of your... Uh, what are they even called? They're not called institutions. They're called the... The, the estates, right? The estates. Most of what you do there and how you influence it isn't actually related to, for example, I don't know, knights doing better or faring better, the church faring better. No, it's you pressing a button, right? Here, the IG makeup changes because of all of these changes to the econ economic setup of a country. I love that so much. It's just so much. The CK3 also is just not at all emulating any of this, but Victoria 3 is a very, very special kind of, uh, of game without a doubt. Uh, unless they give you more coal too. Anyway, I will now stop talking about how to optimize our coal mines for the purposes of developing a capitalist economy. Oh, just like how the paper industry could be privatizing by adding sulfur, the glass industry could be privatized by adding lead. I'll build some lead mines as well. Very good, of course. Um, do you require certain PMs in order to change ownership? You need to advance beyond the most basic production PM to use anything other than merchant guilds for most buildings, because here we're talking, of course, again about the effect that I brought up earlier. Well, this could have gone better. As you can see, the paper mills are faring very, very poorly. Let's take a look at this, right? Let's try, try to understand before we continue why they are faring poorly. Um, here we can see it appears to be publicly traded. We do have a different technology, but we're not using it. And we have a level 11. Jesus, that is a lot of levels of a paper mill. Um, where were we at with this one? Only level 6. Yeah, okay. Level 11 seems a bit extreme, but I would argue... That the issue here, we have almost full employment. The issue clearly lies in these two factors. Nobody's using paper and sulfur doesn't exist enough. Once you change this, the sulfur mines will make less money because obviously, you know, uh, the uh, paper mills will pay less for it. But it does mean that the paper mills will actually become beneficial. That is the way you can read this UI. Whether you actually want sulfur to be cheaper depends on which IGs you want. That's, you know, exactly where the UI might fail. You might look at this and go, oh no, my sulfur is doing poorly, I need to have more sulfur. But maybe this building is exactly what you need to keep a certain class of people either suppressed or in power. I didn't build enough sulfur mines, so price of sulfur is high. Increased production of paper lowers the price. Between these factors, paper mills are very unprofitable, exactly as I talked about it. On the plus side, my government expenses just went down a lot. I think I actually just need to downsize my paper industry. Yeah, I... I looked at this. That That is a rough one. Um, I can't support the number of mills I have because they are just too damn productive. 
And there we go. Problem solved. I removed some paper mills elsewhere in Japan, so he kept them uh, in place in Chubu, but removed them elsewhere. Both paper and sulfur are now reasonably priced. Build more mines, consume less of it, and the building is profitable once more. There you can see, yep, the price is significantly down. There's less paper in the world. And with that, all of a sudden, we're looking at a situation where the building is profitable. And quite a bit, I would say, right? From minus 3.5k to plus 3.07k. Very nice. All these extra mines are making tools quite expensive. I'll make more. Um, what is, why is auto expand off? I like to micro. And I want to point that out as well. If at any moment you look at this and go like, man, what Daniel is playing here doesn't make any sense. It seems unreasonable. It seems min-maxing. Daniel, I think, is just a bit of a min-maxer, and that's completely fine. You can clearly play this game in this way, but if you wanted to roleplay, if you wanted to say, oh, wait a minute, my current government is supported by this, so even if I dislike this faction, I won't weaken them on purpose. He is weakening them on purpose, and with that, of course, we're looking at somebody that doesn't order expand the industry. He simply goes on and micromanages them as he wants to. Next up for privatization, the clothes industry. That'll take more dyes. I think I might have enough of that. <clears throat> enough of that already. Let's find out. I did not have enough dye. Yeah, so the clothes industry has moved on to a different PM and all of a sudden the dye is just insane. And this is a very nice graph because as much as I was talking about earlier that the UI, in my opinion, can't actually capture everything in a way that then lets you play without, you know, you needing to consult uh, various other menus to really understand the impact of a decision. Um, I do think that they do a great job at depicting the base information. Let's take a look at this. The Kansai price is 57. It's the same as the Japanese market price because infrastructure doesn't impact anything negatively. Kansai has a perfect connection to the actual market capital. Uh, you can see Kansai's consumption in particular here, though, showing off that uh, most of, oh, actually, a good portion at the very least, almost one third of the buy orders within the Japanese market come from from Kansai itself. So that is where the consumption largely goes. It is produced in synthetics plants and dye plantations and used in textile mills, glassworks and paper mills. I assume that we are using this right now in the textile mill right here. And you can see nobody was using it and all of a sudden the price goes up like crazy. Um, I would really like it if you could even, and I don't think this is viable, which again the UI part, I would like it. Maybe the detail screen con uh, contains this, but I would like it if you could tell Okay, wait a minute. Which industry that uses this was, for example, increased or decreased in the time frame of this change in the price? I would like to see that because I can definitely envision situations where you don't really micro a certain branch of your industry and look at it and go like, what the hell actually happened here? And to understand that it might be good to actually know which buildings changed their setup or their production methods as you were going for this change of price. For reasons I'm not going to fully investigate, my national budget just increased significantly. I suppose I'm making a whole lot of government goods very cheap, and I suppose all these fancy new PMs are creating a lot of taxable businesses and citizens. Industrialization in a nutshell, eh? The problem with expanding dye plantations is that they employ some very wealthy clergymen who are already uncomfortably powerful. So here we have a negative effect, where he did micromanage everything, but he micromanaged a faction that he dislikes to become more important. I'm very, very slowly researching mutual funds so that I can unlock PMs that employ even more capitalists. Then I will kick out the clergy of the agricultural in industry, not including subsistence farmers, uh, farms. Currently, my farms employ both. I have a lot of government money. I'm not even close to my innovation cap. Might as well expand my universities. Here we have an event. We have secured funding for philosophy departments in all of our institutions of, our, uh, of higher learning. The University of Shikoku has chosen to focus this funding on advancing Hegelian dialectics. Very interesting Japanese uh, pathway right here. Realized my steel mills were hugely unprofitable due to overproduction. Easily corrected. People weren't even annoyed that I fired them because the building was unable to recruit to full capacity due to low wages. Yeah, so they didn't really lose much in terms of standard of living. When that happens, I tend to increase demand, such as tools or engines and so on. I didn't really have anything to spend steel on, so basically he was producing something that just was fa uh, faring very, very well, uh, pa very badly, and he didn't want to build up an entire industry around steel. Now, capitalism is finally a relevant political force. 6% industrialists, not that many, but look at this number, keep it in mind, it is a number that will change drastically. I'm going to immediately put them in the government alongside the intelligentsia. They really, really hate religion right now and we're passing freedom of conscience. The capitalists are aligning perfectly with my goals. Yeah, so they really, really hate religion. I think it might be because of him. This looks like enlightenment, right? Uh, so this is something that happened just because I assume, if, if I think about this, and we talked about this in the past as well, how characters impact the uh, interest groups and how those ideologies change over time thanks to the characters, I would guess that because they were marginalized and because they they may have been unhappy as well with the state of the country and because the monks may have been in government at some point, they were saying, 
we hate or we will generate a, an ideology now that hates religion. At least that is what I could come up with. What the actual requirements are, I can't tell you. But that is the general logic that this sort of ideology for the leader character follows. And I like that. It really dives into day-to-day -day politics, whereas these traits very, very rarely, if at all, actually change. Now, I'm going to immediately put them into government, right? Uh, but state Shinto. I actually need to pass more lenient religious laws in order to state Shinto to make any sense. If I switched religion right now, almost my whole population would be discriminated against and there would be a revolution. I get this gameplay-wise. I get what's happening here. If you take a decision that changes your state religion and your pops haven't adopted it, they will be discriminated now. I don't know enough. If you know about Japanese history in the in the time frame of state Shinto really being something that was being created, let me know under which circumstances that was. I it it doesn't it sounds a bit counterintuitive, right? That it's instead of being a progression of the already existing uh, form of religion, Buddhism and, and ancestor worship, instead of being a, a progression, it basically is a, a lane switch, right? At least it sounds counterintuitive to me, but do let me know, I would be very excited to read a comment on that topic. I'm going to throw the common man a bone and build some rice farms. Reducing the price of food will make people happier. I've been trying to pass a more secular religious law for years. My next checkpoint is a decade away. I think we need to give up on this for now. Um, so clearly, he hasn't created the circumstances for his religious landscape yet to really change things drastically. And that is big. We always, and here's a min-maxer, it has to be pointed out, if you don't min-max, if you see it a bit more realistic, right, you have the choice to do that. But as you can see, even with min-maxing, it takes him years and years and years. We were at the start of this in the year 853, now it's 1855 as you can see, so two years passed, but it will take years, so let's say 1860, realistically speaking, if you don't min-max, or if you min-max at the earliest, you would get this law through. If you don't min-max, maybe 1865, 1870, and all of a sudden, we're in a realistic angle for the restoration of Japan when it comes to the time. And I think that is actually quite nice. You know, even if he min-maxes, he still has these big issues coming his way right here. And it's very, I think, uh, encouraging to see because things going a bit too fast, even if that was designed by the devs, was always a bit of a worrying point, I think, for many people. But here we have it. It, it takes even a min-maxer a long time before they can actually change things in such a meaningful way. Now, I stopped passing the laws everyone hated, and coincidentally, a lot less people wanted to overthrow the government. I love this so much. It's, it's true, right? They don't become loyalists or anything, but they just all of a sudden were like, you know what? They, they stopped the initiative. They actually listened. I'm out of here. I'm no longer radical. I love this graph so much. Uh, haha, no. Enact peasant levy, support 14, radicalism 1, and 253k people out of, what, 40 million support this. Yeah, obviously, that is not strong enough, but this is the last attempt of the samurai to return. Um, they're gone for good, the samurai. I thought they'd become the new upper crust of the military. Yeah, but by doing that, they were absorbed into the new system. They are no longer a distinct political force, so the armed forces clearly changed their situation. Uh, I assume that this means, with this shift, we didn't actually see it, but I assume that the samurai may have uh, changed their ideology when we kicked out the samurai in the last episode. They, have made, uh, they may have changed their ideology to no longer endorse peasant levies and instead, now that they're the armed forces of Japan, endorsing a professional army and such, right? I think that is what may have happened here. The old samurai with their old ideology are gone for good and are no, uh, have no way of returning. That is at least how I read it. Uh, speaking of the military, I do have some cash lying around. Could expand the military a little. Uh, army or navy? Why not both? Well, that's depressing. People have been complaining about the difference in living standards between us and our neighbors in Sakhalin. Is that a star? <laughs> I, I would guess that the uh, that the locals did not have a united flag in Sakhalin. But does that does that not look like the generic American flag in uh, in games? Uh, very funny. But yeah, Sakhalin appeared apparently superior. You know, interesting. We could probably reform the tax system. Currently, we're still doing a lot of land-based ta uh, taxation on the peasantry. I'm going to try enacting per capita taxation. This would increase revenue from taxing the urban people, correct? Yes, it would. I'm having an issue passing laws, though. Everything takes forever because my government is just not very legitimate. I'm having an issue... Uh, right. Oh, I understand the problem. I'm an autocracy. Right. Yes. Um, If you are an autocracy and your leader is a member of an interest group that is not in government, your legitimacy will suffer significantly. Uh, yeah. I could get a ton of legitimacy by adding the armed forces to the government because that's who the emperor supports. Well, that made things so much easier. It's capitalism time. Mutual funds unlocked. 
Uh, publicly owned PM. Yep. I moved a whole lot of industries over to public ownership now. Very nice. So that is clearly now changing the power. And you can see this right here as well. As in publicly traded company, capitalists own shares in businesses. Industrialists becoming more and more powerful. From the last look that we had right here, 6%. All of a sudden, look at that. Beautiful. Where, where did it go? 10.7%. I love this. This really a drastic shift in power. If you don't time it right, you would have the petite bourgeoisie, you would have the samurai, you would have the landowners go against you. But he min-maxed it and he timed it right and all of a sudden he can actually build a new, a very, very different society. Big fan. Could this become a problem later? I'm sure that the interests of wealthy capitalists will always align with the objectives of the state. See, capitalists, Japanese Mayana, have decided to donate generously to the poor. Many among them even advocate for the per capita taxation law, agreeing that it would be fair means of redistributing wealth. I, that is so fascinating to me. I have to assume it may be because of the Enlightenment leader, it may be because they're so loyal. I, I would be really, I love the fact, and, and I can't stress this enough because it's so important to me. I remember us talking about this very, very early on into the dev diaries of this game. I was worried, I was very concerned about the question of whether interest groups could adjust to the real circumstances of your game. Whether, for example, if the trade unions rule with the Catholic Church, they could have distributism, or whether the trade unions fundamentally would say, sorry, but I'm an anarchist socialist, actually, I hate religion. And that's not the case. They can adjust to where they are, where they stand, whether they are friends with the Catholics because they're in government or not. I love this. For some reason, the capitalists appear to be very collectivist. A big, big fan. Is it because it's preferable to land-based taxation? Yes. We're really close to hitting our industrialization goal for the restoration. There we go. Two journal entries down, one to go. The hardest one is left. I need to end my economic isolation and become recognized. So becoming recognized is necessary to go on to become, to actually do the Komei restoration. And it's the year 1858. I really want to highlight this. So much has been done. So much has been changed in 22 years of gameplay. And yet, we're looking at a situation where still so much lies ahead of him. When you think about Victoria to Japan, <laughs> when you think about any fairly, I, I would argue, um, non-prime target audience sort of a country in most games, you have very little to do. In the time frames where, for example, in Victoria 2, you become civilized. In CK3, where, you know, if you're tribal, you don't really have much to engage with. You're blocked from actually going up higher in tech if you're an unreformed religion, if you're still tribal, if you're not feudal or clan. All that sort of stuff, right? Um, obviously, it could be way worse in CK3 if you compare it to, again, Victoria 2's uh, experience as Japan. It was a very boring time. So much has happened and so much still needs to happen and only 22 years have passed. Or, wait, I should say, already 22 years have passed. Um, very, very nice. I, I like the pacing of this. There, there were some things, of course, where, like, as the shogunate, you remove the shogunate faction from government, which is like, uh, I, you know, it doesn't really make sense. But the actual pacing of how you can work this out, if you min-max it, I'm completely on board with this. This is a very player-driven, very aggressive sort of awakening of Japan, rather than the Commodore Perry coming and knocking at your door, right? So this obviously is much, much faster than historically accurate, but the pacing still is very much something that I'm on board with. The AI is quite passive in the current build. The USA is nowhere near the West Coast. I'm very likely to pass my tax reforms this year. After that, I should really get back to disempowering the monks. Nice. There's quite a lot of support for private schools versus religious schools. And the monks are getting a lot of power from controlling the school system. Ah, I'm actually locked into a religious school because state religion. It all comes down to that, really. I guess I just need to tackle the problem head on. To dismantle the monks. To get rid of that state religion and institute Shinto religion. He now needs to actively and directly go against them. And that is where the breaking point will take place. We're going to see that in a second. Are you going to implement democracy in the future? No, I don't think so. Here we go again. Let's try to secularize a little. So many years have passed. You know, uh, the last time we tried was 1855, I think. Now it's 1858. Let's say it's 1860 right now. I don't know. I'm just making it up. He's attempting after the shift in power has continued. He's attempting to actually oust them. And look at that, the Yakut Uprising has taken place. This is a diplomatic play right here. They are in the initial phase. Uh, it's just the Yakut Uprising versus the Russians. So this is basically a cultural secession, which means that they will trigger this and other forces can obviously aid the Yakut Uprising or the Russians if they really were so obliged. Um, Sakhalin, you can see, is un... Yeah, they are decentralized. And then right here we have the Great Qing. If you were to join the Yakut Uprising, could you add the Wogol to become recognized? They would have to offer that to me as a condition for joining. Yeah, because it needs to be the primary war leader making the offers and requests and so on. 
you can't force them into promising you something, basically. Do they stand any chance? None whatsoever. And here we go, finally. We now have freedom of choice. Gain from changing to freedom of choice, plus 100 authority. I assume before that, he actually had more authority. And then plus 25% Buddhist monk devout political strength. Again, here I also assume that at before that, they basically had more power boosts. Uh, religions will be accepted based on shares a trade with a state religion, Mahayana in Japan. I'm really curious about this. I can see this, that maybe the Buddhist monks are basically... I mean, I know that the Buddhist monks played a big, big role. There were many, many uprisings. They oftentimes had a big, big influence on the emperor. And I know that there... Ah, I can't recall. There was a particular institution, a particular temple that then later on got sacked and completely disemboweled, basically, in, in its power position. I assume that this is meant to emulate this. I honestly, like, the more I think about it, maybe it is completely intuitive. Maybe it is completely logical that to... Put the emperor really on top of it you need to dethrone the buddhist monks right maybe let me know if you know more about japanese history than i do anyway now that he has passed this now that shinto would no longer be discriminated because it just needs to share a trade with state religion you all of a sudden can adopt Sh uh, state shinto with the restoration of the imperial household to political power it would be wise to integrate local beliefs into an official state religion emphasizing the emperor's divinity adopt state shinto is possible if has completed the Honorable Restoration Journal entry. Interest group is not marginalized. Oh, and then the dishonorable restoration must be when the when the Americans land, right? Japan is an acted monarchy. When taken, Shinto becomes the state religion in Japan, and then here it comes, this is the most important part, the devout will lose the Buddhist moralist ideology and gain the Shinto piousness ideology. There is a shift, a massive shift that normally does not occur. Interest groups do not shift their, you know, actual ideologies around like this, but here, they get rid of Buddhist moralist ideology and go to Shinto piousness, which I assume binds them to the monarchy rather than the reverse where they hold the reins in their hands. What does Shinto piousness do? Mostly it makes the monks like the monarchy a lot. Nice. Then now they are useful, it looks like. Now, th uh, now though, I need to let things cool down a bit. This isn't the time to press the monks further. Without their state religion, they should start declining quite rapidly. Once they've calmed down a bit, I'll take away the religious schools as well. Right, so if he pushes them too fast now or too far now, they will actively revolt. While they cool down, you could work on other laws such as wealth voting. Oh, and it's also time to reform the bureaucracy. I feel like that will make them very angry. Because the clergymen will be less employment, less standard of living, they become even more angry. I understand this isn't the same as, you know, even taking away religious schools, but I am pretty sure this might be the boiling point. Are bureaucrats better administrators? Not inherently better, no. But this means I can kick the monks out of government administrations, weakening their clout. Things are looking up for the capitalists. So this is, can we get a year here? I don't think we can, actually. Uh, let me just check. I don't think we can get a year here. As you can see, there's a civil war coming. But I'm looking at this. I'm wondering which year we are in here, where the industrialists now have 70.9%. Um, the years worked towards them the entire time. It took him, like, five, I think, six years to go to... S from six to 10%. I know it's 17.9. This could be, like, 1862, 1863... Curious, but it is a slow enough change, changing process in my opinion. My god, look at this loyalty. Isn't that insane? <laughs> they love the monarchy. Price of grain keeps rising. I suppose there are a lot more people in Japan now. Stop buying grain. Sell, sell, sell. Population is up to 49 million. Very nice. I think we need better PMs. I'm going to increase my law enforcement institution. Lots of people are angry about how I abolish the state religion. Around 10% of people in Japan are now Shinto. We're really drowning in money. I'm actually going to lower taxes. I'm sensing an opportunity. The monks are just barely not angry enough that I can probably get away with removing religious schools. Um, why not expand the Navy and Army? Hmm. I could have the universities drastically reduced their research rate for a while to pass this law quicker. Right. So, basically, he is hoping here that he can weaken the monks even further and even faster if he gets uh, rid of the schools now. But if he can't do it, that's a civil war right there. And that is something we talked about in the last video as well, where it's like, sometimes it seems like interest groups take the big L much too easily and don't blame the government enough, but you can see it right here. They are very angry and at the cusp of a rebellion. That is how it should be. As you change the laws, they should be actively and very aggressively reacting to this. They're doing that. The teachers of our higher institutions of learning have offered to advise the government in the implementation of the new private schools. There are certainly differences between teaching children the fundamentals and the more advanced education offered at our universities. Nevertheless, as architects of the upper floors of this towering structure of knowledge, we believe the least we can do is provide some insight into how the foundation should be built. I think I'll take them up on the offer. I think intelligentsia will be buffed from this, right? 
At this rate, I'm quite likely to pass the law next year. Make private healthcare violated too. We have no healthcare. I don't think healthcare is a real priority for me right now anyway. And we got private schools. Fun. Oh no. Mm-hmm. Every week that this has changed, and this has changed, so currently there's a revolution buildup of 25.5%, and every week this has changed by 4.7%, up to a maximum of 95% based on the radicalism of movement to restore religious schools. We are experiencing a problem. It's called unemployment. There are so many people in Japan that there are not even enough rooms in subsistence farms to employ them. We're going to have to institute some sort of welfare system. My capitalist advisors have a great idea. Poor laws. Right, the capitalists like them because it keeps them in power and the poor strata shuts up. On second thought, this might not be the best time. I'm 95% towards revolution, he would just piss off more people, pardon the language, and that could lead to a devastating result. But that result is coming anyway. A peaceful march in Hokkaido has suddenly turned violent as protesters and police have begun to clash in the streets. Put them all down by force. Use whatever force is needed. These upstarts should know their place. Do they not understand that the police are there for their safety? We cannot and will not look weak to these radicals. And with that, the Japanese civil war has started and it's going okay. So, let's take a look at this. Um, I am not sure when you would get this map mode, right? Um, this appears to be a military map mode. I think this indicates our territory. So we have Kanto and we have uh, the south where we know that we built a bunch of territories that, well, a bunch of industries that made people very happy, which is why they didn't rebel down there. On the other hand, I do think that this is where that f Buddhi Buddhist uh, temple that I was remembering there is situated. And then, of course, the north that I believe he neglected quite a bit. Those people rebelled. Um, Tohoku, Chubu, and Kanzai. Mm, Chubu did have uh, factories still. Either way, so this map mode is a bit odd to me. I'm not... Like, this doesn't... Do they not have, like, their own symbol or something? I assume this indicates a country that we're at war with. This is our country. We have a front here. We have a front here. I think there's, like, basically there's a split here. We can't tell, but there's a split here, this front, and then we have this front. The original borders are marked in deep red here. We have advanced. Here, I'm not sure what this means. I think this means... I assume that nobody is present currently at this front, but they are advancing on these two front lines. And it's looking good. Um, yeah, he seems to be winning, but obviously there's devastation. I, I have to reiterate, and I want to clarify this as well. I do not dislike the idea of flags as occupation symbols at all. I think, per se, that is not a terrible idea. I think what makes it such a good idea in my mind, on a principled level, is that me as Japan, that is imperialist, conquering parts of China, for example, will feel and look different, and that will influence my subconscious gameplay decisions, right? It, my roleplay decisions, and you know I'm very roleplay heavy. It will influence seeing the imperial flag there and realizing this is an imperialist conquest, rather than, for example, seeing a, a Japanese communist flag there that indicates we are freeing some people with this... With this uh, Mandate with the agenda anyway, whether we free them or not, you know, hey, that's up to the communist dictatorship that we live under. But I hope you get my point. With the flags being represented on the map like this, it's much easier to feel the difference in government that is currently conquering or losing land. But I'm not sure. I feel like it might just be better to just have the symbol like once per... per occupied state or maybe like just per state. It's just... I find it a bit odd. I mean, for Japan, it works quite well. You have the situation where it's the, uh, the the flower here, right? But like, for example, if this was a tricolor, if this was a very particular, very complex flag, it would just look very odd. I feel like maybe if you change the scale of how this happens, it would look much more satisfying. As per se, I mean, I, I gotta tell you, in general, I don't think that by default you're looking at this and going like, oh, I don't understand what's happening. I think you understand quite well what's happening, right? We have this... Uh, line right here, I see it now actually of this front line right here, and obviously they're not connected because this one right here is separate as well. So this whole thing here is one front line, and this is a front line, yeah. You can read the information here, I just think that the red on red, for example, the difficulties in actually seeing the symbols and such, just some tweaks, I think, would do the system well. I understand in, in theory, I think, why you would opt for a flag on the occupation here, right? Yeah, anyway, um, let's see how this actually comes out at launch. So, we're making up for, uh, for for it. Yeah, we're winning. But it's expensive and everyone is having a bad time. Well, that was horrible. 
uh, which are just sided with the rebellion, just the monks. We won but standard of living across the country has taken a plunge and there's a lot less gold in the treasury. The good news is that the Shinto monks are finally broken. I assume this means he is suppressing them. They're clearly unhappy as they should be because they didn't get their churches. Things aren't working out. And as you can see here, that's the Shinto symbol. They actually changed this core ideology. I like that a lot, that this is done. Obviously, you have a different leader. Not sure what this means, but they are down to 5.1%. Uh, an IG that has, is only at 5.1% could not get this Soul of Rebellion running again, and with that, their back has been broken. Big, big fan of this effect. He pushed them too far, he could have taken it slower, instead he had to have the Civil War. And this put him in front of a very big choice. Do we want to break their back quicker, make it so that you can then move on further towards other institutions or such, or do you want to take it slower and not have all these, uh, you know, uh, veterans that may have lost a limb, that you don't have all these deaths, all these losses, that sort of stuff. This is a very important decision because it's not at all a decision that is outwards minded. It is a decision that exclusively asks, do you want a society post-war? Or would you like to preserve your society and keep some old elites around, uh, around as long as it means there's no war? He chose the war. I, I like that you don't get that in any of the other games. So this is definitely a big heap or a big leap in quality. Anyway, so the civil war against the monks is over. Standard of living took a nosedive. There's a pretty significant movement to get back to state religion. Restore state religion, support 73, radicalism 16 and 12.4 million. Yeah, that is pretty big. The landowners, the rural folk and the church are all supporting it. However, I don't think it's quite a civil war level. The landowners have become quite powerful as well. This is a major problem, so he let them grow powerful. He clearly mismanaged it to, to a degree despite being a very good min-maxer at this game. The challenges thrown at you here are all entirely internal. I really, I, I really want to make this clear. This is why I'm so damn excited for the route that Victoria 3 has taken. At no point in this playthrough so far, and it will of course become important because it needs to be recognized, at no point in this playthrough at any given moment has he interacted with an outside force. The entire time, 30, 35, 40 years, however deep we are into this now, right? Uh, you can see we're in 1865. Yeah, there you go. So 30 years, 30 years. He has only done internal things and he still hasn't broken the opposition because they are so entrenched in the laws, in the institutions and in the economic reality of Japan. You don't get this anywhere else. You don't, you just don't get that anywhere else. Huge, huge fan. Uh, they oppose just about everything that I want to do. Any reason that Avout are in favor of the movement? Uh, they just try to overthrow the government. They are simply very unhappy. Uh, ways to suppress the landowners, abolish the monarchy, and we're not doing that. Move away from autocracy. I don't really want to institute democracy, but we could at least become an oligarchy, which would empower capitalists as well as aristocrats rather than only the former. And finally, I can just continue modernizing the economy. I'll do this anyway, but it's the slowest means towards political change. I think I'll start by enacting oligarchy. The Emperor must be advised by a cabal of capitalistic oligarchs who know what's best for everyone. So long as we strike a healthy balance between ivory tower intellectuals and oligarchic capitalists, everything will be okay. On a completely unrelated note, I'm increasing my, pol uh, pol uh, my police institution to level 4. What is the education institution level? 3. So that's pretty good. Uh, aren't you also balancing the armed forces these days? Yep, they have become a part of the government, largely just because they are the Emperor's favorites. They are very loyal. So obviously the Emperor supports the uh, armed forces with that they have to be in government for you to be very legitimate. If you aren't legitimate, you're looking in a situation where your government will suffer to pass any laws whatsoever. Uh, no need to abolish child labor to increase it more. Uh, so you need to abolish child labor to increase it more. Indeed, might do that someday, but not anytime soon. Can you guess what caused the number to go down? So we're having a great time from 1836 to 1865. The GDP is going up like crazy and then boom. That's a civil war, huh? <laughs> and this is the exact internal payoff where you can take a look at this. And obviously they are recovering. They are coming back from it. But now that you have wounded people that can't properly work, that have become dependents, you might have to pay even more for you know everything going on in the social net, uh, whether you have an institution there for that or not. You may have to take a look at whether certain areas are now so low in migration that they might go elsewhere rather than stay there because you know they feel very uncomfortable with the situation. I doubt that Japan is actually, uh, that the pops are actually accepted anywhere else and these are their homelands, so they're unlikely to migrate away. But yeah, this is the weekly GDP that shows you how he has succeeded massively when it comes to just doing internal politics and yet, that was a huge risk, choosing the civil war right there. Yes, he restored it. Yes, he retook it all. But, I mean, we're still not back to where we were before it broke out. That is an opportunity cost decision. Literally has nothing to do with, you know, for example, external threats like it is in every other game. 
that is an opportunity cost that you have to consider just internally. Victoria 3 is just so unique. Seriously, I, I cannot wait for this game. I, I always wanted an internal, largely internal society builder. Obviously, diplomacy and such. I mean, it plays a huge role in maintaining your navy, playing the right cards and diplo plays and such. But this entire playthrough, everything that happened, everything that he altered, happened just internally so far. Isn't that crazy? I, I think it's pretty insane. Anyway, what is the population of Tokyo? The population of the Kanto region is almost 8 million. The real question is, what are those spikes? Usually a lot of drastic PM changes while posts, so basically he goes around, changes industries, and then and then the industry actually recalibrates and puts it back together. Can you guess what uh, caused the number to go down? Merely a temporary slowdown in the economy. It still grew. With the Civil War, I had completely forgotten that I started making fertilizer. Let's take a look at that. You can see they're making fertilizer right here in the north. And you can also see that it produces grain and, you know, that looks pretty good. Fertilizer that is being consumed now with this new production method costs basically nothing. Obviously, that is going to change. But that means grain will become cheaper. Population will get and will be able to buy grain for cheaper. Standard of living rises. Boom. All of a sudden, loyalists abound. This is a huge change here, ultimately. Uh, any supply, I think, any change to the supply of... Very, very basic goods is a huge change and a huge leap forward in how your country can operate. So this is, you can see just how important it is to really industrialize to get this very effect. Time for the price of grain to go down, which will actually help me politically too. The aristocrats running the farms won't be as wealthy, damn grain hoarders, and of course the poor people will become happier. It seems that cheap food is worth less profitable farms. I don't ne necessarily even want profitable farms. I'd rather have super productive farms that bring down the price of grain and employ impoverished as aristocrats. Price of grain just went from 23% more than base to 3% less. The people will like this. I wonder what we can do with this. Electrical generation. How's it going over here in Romania? Hmm. Does Romania have an interaction to annex Moldavia and Wallachia? Pretty funny. Market prices are looking healthy. Um, let's take a look at this. Opium. Still, nobody seems to be buying it. Or maybe some minuscule people are buying it. But yeah, basically just very expensive because nobody actually produces it. Fertilizer has now become a good bit more expensive. But that's not bad because it just means it's being used in a reasonable capacity. Um, so that then the price of grain can go down first. We got the meat here that comes from the whaling. It's doing, you know, okay, it is fairly high, but it could be much higher if you didn't have any whaling production to begin with. Uh, fruit, also fairly expensive, but that is a luxury good, much like the whale meat. Uh, steel, actually something that he definitely should work on, because that is, of course, the way towards the future of industrialization. Maybe the same for coal. Um, what do you got at the bottom here? Just some luxury stuff. Sulfur doing, actually, yeah, no, here's a very healthy economy from what I can tell. Think about it. Most of the goods that are expensive that you should really care about are, for example, timber, coal, and steel. He needs to get those to be better so that he can then move on and actually industrialize even further and further. However, you can't see grain here. Grain, very cheap. You can't see other very, very basic goods here. Very, very cheap, quite clearly. And I think that actually just showcases that his entire country is doing quite well when it comes to keeping the lower strata happy. The only thing that's really expensive is fertilizer, and that is an artificial shortage created by me. If fertilizer is cheap, uh, cheap, farms are more profitable. Makes perfect sense. He is starving out the aristocrats. This is the ide uh, ideal government body. You may not like it, but this is what peak performance looks like. Uh, looks like. I want to point out up here, by the way, the landowners do react to this. In, in the previous example, where he just removed the shogunate, from the government, it feels very odd that they don't react, but in this they do react, because standard of living going down means that this interest group's now be a group now becomes unhappier, because the pops in it are unhappier, potentially radicalizing the whole thing. Uh, anyway, industrialists, right, let's take a look at the government right here. We have the industrialists still with the uh, old leader, I believe, and with the old uh, idea here of what I can only guess is enlightenment. Then the intelligentsia, man, they're all so loyal. The intelligentsia here, anti-religion, anti-authority, I assume anti-servedom and such, also pacifists, supposedly. And then he just reinforces this yet again. Then right here, the armed forces. They love the country, they love to serve, and they love war is what I can interpret into this. This seems a bit counterintuitive, but it depends, of course, on what sort of laws you create. Many times in history, people banded up together that initially, ideologically, seemed quite far apart, but then realistically, were able to work it out. Uh, ultimately, we can tell that everybody's very happy. I mean, industrialists have become much, much richer. We know them from their baby stage, where they had 6% in clout, and now they're 23.3%. That is massive, just incredible. So you can see things here change uh, over a pretty long time frame, I would argue, and 
things, you know, took a lot of work to change, but now you can reap the benefits by having this very, very loyal government indeed. Meanwhile, the loser opposition. Yeah, landowners declawed. Look at that. Shinto monks declawed on the way back up, I suppose, but still, this is not even comparable to what they had in the past. The peasants, honestly, is what I would consider something that he might want to deal with. Be that by getting rid of the rural folks or the peasants, or by making them a bit happier, maybe passing some laws that they like, right? Um, and then on here we have the petite bourgeoisie, they appear happy as well, I assume, because basically their agenda, you know, fits the... Uh... Wait a minute, now that I'm looking at this... Oh, he's a... is he a general or something? Interesting, what is this symbol here? I was thinking that this might mean that he's the... Is he the head of state? No, that can't be true. This is the emperor, I want to say? I'm not sure what this symbol means. Either way, but you can see that their goals, fundamentally, of the Petit Bourgeoisie do pretty much align. You know, you, you see right here they have the, I assume this is like patriotism or something. And then right here we have anti-slavery, anti-serfdom. This is the agenda of the government. So if the government pushes through their own agenda, they also make the Petit Bourgeoisie happy. And you can see this right here. Now, the peasants are getting suspiciously po uh, politically conscious here. Yeah, that is what I was worried about. The petite bourgeoisie exists, I guess. They're probably not going to be very relevant this game because he's not actually going for or against them. It just happens that they are also happy with what he does anyway. The price of iron has risen considerably. These particular capitalists are having the time of their lives. 52 standard of living. Jesus. These capitalists are also having a great time. They own the chemical, pla uh, chemical plants that keep the price of fertilizer artificially high. <sighs> 53. Lavish. Population 109. Not many, but it is rising. Uh, a workforce of 30, and they're doing very well. The literacy is so embarrassingly low, though. Obviously, they're a part of the industry uh, interest group here, the industrialists, and look at that. I love that. Political strength, 16.5k. Just these people. 109 people. Isn't that insane? My god, yeah, those are certainly some powerful capitalists right there. Uh, 79. Do nothing capitalists and still lavish. Some of the capitalists are children. And everything is fine, he says. Turmoil from radical pops, 22.44%. Effects of turmoil, uh, turmoil multiplied by minus 95% due to violent suppression, law enforcement. So, he does have some trouble here. Understandably, I would argue. However, nonetheless, he is just suppressing it. Man, that is extremely efficient suppression, I have to admit. Violent suppression and law enforcement, this is, I assume, the institution law enforcement and violent suppression is a decree. I wonder what it does. I, I think it was shown in, in the previous video, right? So this would be a... It would change, I think, mortality or something. Anyway, very interesting. Now, what goods do these capitalists consume? Luxury goods, porcelain, and luxury furniture. Damn. Um, yeah. Nobody else gets to consume that stuff. Art, luxury drinks, services, luxury food, free movement, communication, intoxicants, and heating. Yeah, they're doing very, very well without a doubt. Now, what do we have here? Discord within the armed forces. An influential faction within the armed forces has grown frustrated with their uh, co-members' neutrality on the topic of oligarchy themselves in favor of the law. They have now resolved to form a separate political faction intent on passing it. How can you all stand idly by and watch the world pass before your eyes? Have you no sense of honor, of duty to your fellow man? I say nay to such lack of ambitions, and I dare say I am not alone in this. So basically, they want to change society so that it can move further. In this case, change it to oligarchy. I assume the opposite could have also been true, where somebody says, you are abandoning our traditions, I give you a bad, a bad event now. So this appears to be an event based on the fact that, that he is trying to pass the oligarchy law. With their support, uh, support, the bill shall pass, or the landowners extend an open hand to these mavericks. Ah, he could strengthen the landowners. Honestly, it's an interesting angle. You could pass, if you really want to roleplay as a country, you could start to pass a controversial law, get these sort of events, and then say, oh, oops, the power goes to the opposition, the law gets shelved, the old government falls apart, I now move the strength and landowners into government. Very interesting. I like that angle, actually, where you could be very aggressive in what you do, and then just accept failure sometimes. Just say, oh, sh they, they split it. I, I need to, you know, I'm, I'm changing course. Man, I'm excited to really roleplay this game. Uh, oligarch generals, hooray. Am I reading this right? There are only 110 capitalists in Kansai. This is just one pop. Specifically, the Shinto Japanese capitalist who specifically works in the chemical plants. I give up on this whaling thing, by the way. We just need more meat to feed the hungry capitalists. Hokkaido is going to be a slaughterhouse. Let them eat cake. Let them eat steak. I do not approve of this, though. Labor movement unlocked. And this, of course, changes a bit how people see things. Plus one minimum expected standard of living from literacy. It just spreads to us organically somehow. Um, I wonder how exactly spread works with an isolated country like Japan. He hasn't changed it yet, away from isolation. 
But yeah, I mean, obviously, none of the borders are ever fully closed. I mean, the story of Christianity in Japan, for example, I can tell you is, of course, one where the borders were meant to be closed entirely and still the movement, still the idea of it spread. And so it isn't actually bad or anything that is unrealistic that it did spread. But I do wonder what the modifier actually is like. We're going up to max level police. Yeah, it's time for suppression, huh? Where's poor laws? Uh, where's the poor laws, by the way? Was it done? Civil war got in the way. It's still on the agenda, but I first want oligarchy. And you don't want this due to the aristocrats, right? Correct. Exactly. We now have oligarchy. There you go. So you get some authority. I assume before that, with the full autocracy, it was more authority. Uh, we do remember that Japan had a lot of authority originally in this playthrough. 0.5 legitimacy from government clout, plus 50% political strength of aristocrats, and plus 25% uh, political strength of capitalists. I assume before that was 0 and like 75%, and now it came slightly closer, even if it isn't equal yet. Interest group approval changes from enacting oligarchy. The industrialists approve of the recent change, and the Shinto monks and the landowners disapprove, and that is a massive shift right here. Man, this is a fragile country. I, I love this so much. Japan in this playthrough is so damn fragile. The Shinto monks are back with 17.4%. Isn't that insane? They're back. And he isn't integrating them. He isn't actually governing with them. It seems so so logical, right? To go, Shinto monks, I will accept that I can't pass certain things, but I will integrate you into government because we are, you are loyal to the monarchy now. Instead, he's actively working against 17.4% cloud IGs. Very, very good. I, I like that it is such a fragile country that he's walking this fine line and that it is working out in all fairness. But man, what a what an edge walking right here. Being poor is illegal. That's more or less the idea. Yeah. Is it possible for IGs to have 50% cloud or 90%? It's possible, but 90% is very li uh, unlikely. Is that a challenge? Yeah. Oh no. We've invented Malthusianism. Some intellectuals are warning that if the poor laws are not passed, an increasing population of unproduct uh, unproductive poor will become an unmaintainable burden on society. Growing poor population is an inevitability, an, an inevitability, <laughs> inevitability, I can't read, in a society which does not attempt to control it. Some measures may seem callous to the short-sighted, but if the poor are not discouraged from multiplying, we shall soon have more starving mouths. That's a rough one. Well, that, that event option is massively unbalanced. 20% of the lower strata across the entire country could be radicalized. I need to remember to make a task to balance radicalism and event options in general. It's overall much too strong. Right. It is an in-development process, right? I'm deliber uh, deliberately making more food. I'm just making that food with expensive fertilizer. Interesting. Oil discovered in Chubu. Very nice. They can create oil rigs. The year is now, by the way, 1870. Might I remind you, for all the people that were worried, I, I saw your comments under the last video, that were worried that the restoration and such was moving too fast. 1870. Of a player-driven, a min-maxer-driven restoration, the Kome Restoration is still not finished. To become civilized in Victoria 2 is Japan before 1850, cakewalk. Very, very easy. This is how involved games can be if they don't just look at parts of the world and say, ah, just put some mechanic in there. I love that everything he has done has amounted to him still not being recognized, to him still not actually being in a position of getting rid of isolation, and to him still being very, very fragile in the power structure of his country. Very, very nice. Um, is it not possible to beat China head-on using superior tactics and techniques? Probably possible, just difficult, especially for a country that starts unrecognized. Not when we are outnumbered 7 to 1s. Right, so before going after Korea, I'd want China to collapse. He can't go for it because he's just not far enough yet in her terms of his build-up. I've been building munition plants in order to modernize my military a little. Munition plants need explosives, which meant adjusting my chemical plants a little. Now that we're in the habit of making explosives, I might consider using them for mining as well. Uh, I wonder if auto expand, f expand feature considers running into input shortages. It wouldn't be a very good feature if it didn't. So, honestly, I'm still not clear on how often I would use the auto expand feature because it really depends on how well it can read a situation that even as a player, reading may be very difficult. I would like a, a further explanation on the order expansion, I think. Capitalists demand more tea. I'm going to lower taxes even more. Budget will be a little tight, but we can make it work. I decided to investigate why people in Okinawa are so angry. It was because I largely forgot that, it, uh, that they existed and built absolutely nothing there. So unemployment. I'm getting extremely lucky, uh, unlucky with the polo. So I have a suspicion that the wrong enactments, uh, enactment events are firing. I'm actually going to have to cancel the law. Let's shake things up. We're ending isolationism. So many choices. So this is the active law. I wonder whether he can always change it or whether he had to first undergo kicking out the Shogunate. I assume that is the case. 
that, that unless you kick out the Shogunate, you can't change the law to begin with. But let's take a look at this. He could do mercantilism, protectionism, or free trade. We have a healthy support for all three of them. And the weakest opposition for mercantilism. Free trade is obviously the most extreme form here. So that sees the biggest opposition. It's clear, though, I think, that enough people, and it seems to be largely the government that is in favor of all of these, right? But enough people here seem to be, or well, just the industrialists, I should say. Enough people are against isolationism to make it worthwhile changing it, yeah. Um, what are pros and cons of each? There's a lot to consider. Probably more than I can type out right now. I think we'll ease into the whole foreign trade thing. Let's go with protect uh, protectionism for now. I need to get the deeds on trade rework. We can't, we can't say what one might want to pick here, how it could impact the economy, how that could impact the power situation in the country, how that could impact your laws, your institutions and such, because we don't know how it works. We know the details, or the rough details, I should say, but before we can jump into something that would analyze something this important, yeah, we, we I hope that we're going to see a dev diary soon at some point, if at all, you know, that covers the rework trade mechanics, because I'm very curious about this. Anyway, so far, not liking these foreign ideas so much. Egalitarianism unlocked. That's one minimum expected standard of living from literacy. Egalitarianism is the doctrine of the equality, uh, equality of mankind and the desirability of political, economic, and social equality. Yeah, if you want to be uh, a monarchy, that's not going to work out for you. A problem with leaving isolationism, though. The outside world really doesn't have anything that I want. Relatable. Everything Japan needs, it already produces. Maybe later on, once he industrializes more, but right now, apparently, he doesn't need any of it. Export stuff that you are making, but I need the stuff I'm making, yeah. Welcome to the world of a t uh, of, uh, of uh, autarky, right? When you take care of your own stuff and then don't have anything to offer and don't want anything from the outside world because it is a closed economy. Anyway, let's continue. You can see there's a difference here of a few days between the 11th and the 15th. Let's play some more Japan. I played through a couple of years just now and managed to pass protectionism. This is a major change to the country because it replaces isolationism. We're now at least somewhat open to the wider world's economy, allowing trade routes. So before that, we know now at least, trade routes were not at all possible, which also gives the incentive why the US would come in in a normal play uh, gameplay, right? Uh, and, and open the country because they just really want to trade. Who supported uh, protectionism? The industrialists were hugely in favor of the law. As it stands, there's really nothing in particular that Japan wants to buy from the rest of the world. However, there are some goods that we are overproducing and where it welcomes some exports. In particular, we make a lot of warships, guns, artillery, explosives and ammunition. He did build up his, uh, his army, didn't he? I'm going to start out by selling uh, ammo to the Brits who seem to be in need of it. Restoration complete. Note that I disabled the requirement to become recognized but have not updated the event text yet. Ah... Uh. Isn't that interesting? You no longer need to be recognized to, to restore Japan. Is, is that just a permanent feature? I have to assume so, right? I guess to really put the Emperor in charge, you don't need to be recognized. But he still is recognized, right? A reformed army, an open and recognized country, so he hasn't adjusted, an open country, a new society. Japan stands as an equal among the powers of the world and will perhaps begin to pursue imperial ambitions of her own. By the blessing of heaven, we sit uh, upon the sacred throne on which our ancestors reigned from time immemorial. The civilization and institutions of Japan are so different from those of other countries that we cannot expect to reach the declared end at once. And as our purpose to select from the various institutions prevailing among enlightened nations such are, as are best suited to uh, our present conditions, and adapt them in gradual reforms and improvements of our policy and customs so as to be upon equality with them, the Japanese Empire shall rise, I assume... This might strengthen the armed forces. We will need powerful friends, for we shall make powerful enemies. Railways are the key to our future success. Could this be tech-related? This sounds like industry, this sounds like diplomacy, this sounds like uh, army. Who knows? This, this is a big question for the future. But it appears that you, to reform, to finish the Komei Reformation, you don't need to be recognized, which is kind of fair, considering that Japan didn't get quote-unquote recognized until defeating uh, the, the Russians in 1904, but they were already much, much further on their path before that. So this is actually a, a good separation, I would say. Either way, we're looking at a situation where even after all this... So what, which year is this? Wait a minute. Can, can we see... Uh, yeah. 1876 is when you finish your reformation and can start looking outwards. 1876. There's still a lot to be done internally, don't get me wrong here. But this means... 
you still need to be recognized. You still need to start getting colonies. You, you still need to start getting more import trade routes. You, not, you need to start to build a navy. You need to get rid of any competitors in your immediate sphere, be that in Sakhalin, be that in uh, Hokkaido, be that in Taiwan, for example, right? We're looking at a situation where in 1876, a min-maxer has led their country to actually look outwards. After 1876, that's 30 years. I can't count. That's 40 years. <laughs> 60 more years to go of changing society even further and moving outwards with your politics. And these f first 40 years were incredibly busy, incredibly active. I cannot wait to play this game. Japan still has this comfy thing, I think, that it had going for itself in Victoria 2 as well because it's so isolated, barely anybody touches it. But early on in Victoria 2, Japan had nothing to do. It was very boring. Very, very excited. Very, very exciting stuff. I think it's finally time to pass the poor laws. International trade is starting up. This is the old trade system because you can increase these levels manually. Let's ignore that. On closer inspection, there actually is something Japan needs but can't effectively produce. Sugar. No sugar beets in the game. Japan isn't a suitable place for sugar plantations. We produce a small amount of sugar from other sources, but it's deeply inefficient. I just buy some from the Brits. Trade routes are developing nicely. British sugar for Japanese bullets. The game doesn't make any particular distinction between overseas and not. Even if Okinawa was a good pl uh, place to plant sugar, it's not. It is hardly. It hardly has any arable land. And the poor laws have been passed. We got rather a lot of loyalists from the increased standard of living. Insane. Uh, in fact, I think we want to invest even further in this. I'll make a lot of government administration so I can afford to expand it. By the way, new post-restoration flag. There we go. So, and this actually lets, lets me check something here. Um, I believe... We saw this earlier, and I asked myself, is this the Emperor? And that is why it is... No. So the Emperor definitely is here in the armed forces. It's the same man. So this is not the symbol for the for the emperor. I have to assume. Oh, look at that! It has the tiny, the tiny hourglass. I believe this is a general. So the lead of the petite bourgeoisie is also a general, which might make him important. Except, of course, he was generally happy anyway. So, yeah, let's just ignore that. That clears that up, I suppose. Uh, you can see now he has some time modifiers. I assume this comes from the Kome restoration. We have an empire. Our population is almost 60 million, up from what 39, right? Um, and then we have 44.8% literacy, could be better, could be worse. Standard of living didn't really increase, but I think it did change its sort of distribution quite a bit. Uh, we have a very strong army, I would argue, at the very least. Uh, culture is Japanese and state religion is Shinto, and then 930 arable land. How much peasants do we have? We still have 26 million peasants. I'm continually employing more and more people, but I am not keeping up with the population growth, hence the need for poor laws. 1.71 pounds per capita. Which country has highest standard of living and GDP per capita currently? Our population is about the same, the Great Britain's now, not counting tiny countries, experiencing a gold rush. Sweden has the highest standard of living. I would much, uh, I wonder if you had auto expanded on all buildings, then peasants would already be employed. I would much rather have manual control over my construction queue. So he's essentially saying, yes, we have a problem here with the peasants, but the way I optimized it was much, much better for us. I'm building constantly, and I think I can prioritize construction better than automatic building construction. Given our standard of living ties into popula uh, popular descent, I take it that these countries are going to be very happy and stable, very likely. Uh, can I safely assume that you have at least one level of, of construction sectors? That's really not how building works. I think it's time to move on from agrarianism. We have a lot of capitalists and they have money. Time for them to start investing in the economy. We are moving to interventionism. So he did one tiny step and now says we can actually take one further. Makes sense. You're jumping the gun here, Siam. I don't think it's called prosperity time. You have nothing I want. They don't want the trade agreement. Whatever that would mean in the modern system, I can't tell you. Anyway, we're reaching the end here, of course. Uh, remind me what a trade agreement does. No tariffs, so essentially no barriers to trade. You're still in different markets, so you need to make import-export routes, but they are cheaper. I assume it basically means pretty much the same today as well, right? In the new system? Sounds reasonable even in the new system. Uh, is an economic world conquest possible? I don't think that's very likely. Rising costs of running a growing government aren't really keeping up with my revenue. We're actually losing money now for the only time other than the civil war. Uh, you could also eat small countries first, so you're much bigger by then. Networks up until a certain point. Great powers are very unlikely to bend the knee without a conflict. This is about the question of recogn uh, recognition. I'm hoping that getting the capitalist investment pool up and running will subsidize enough of my construction budget that I'll be in the green again. Um, this is assuming you don't have the other 95% of the world yet, yeah. There are very few radicals in the country. I really don't need max level police. I'll downsize them to make room for more poor laws. Yes, interventionism has, was the right choice. Yeah, look at that. Wow, investment pool 12.7 million. 
All right, I need to call it quits for today. I'll leave you with this. No colonial affairs to, uh, affairs to colonial exploitation. So he is changing a law. But sadly, this is where the uh, AAR ends. We never get to the full external point of view, building colonies, becoming recognized, kicking out the uh, colon uh, colonial powers from Europe, right? And uh, from Asia, I should say. It's a shame that this AAR ended where it did because of the restrictions of, of course, you know, what we had seen in the... Uh, in, in the change of, of game systems. I really, however, want to point out, and I know that I've done it several times, but I just love it so much. I love it to pieces. 40 years pass, you were so busy, you were so engaged in changing the face of your society and having a civil war because you mismanaged it slightly, right? 40 years pass, there's still 60 years to go, and he hasn't blobbed out yet. If I play 40%, right? of a Crusader Kings 3 entire game. From 867 to 1444, we're talking about what? We're talking about like 300 years. If I wanted to, if I min-maxed, I'm conquering the whole world. In that time frame, I got everything I need. You can do that in EU4. I mean, people do it all the time on Twitch. You can do it in Hoi4. You can do it in, in, in basically any game. Except Victoria 2, I will give it that. But Victoria 2 would not have nearly as much internal management. The fact that the phase before you expand is this intense and important and the fact that then afterwards you still have so much time and so many opportunities to get engaged internally and externally in 60 years left is amazing. I like this AAR quite a lot despite the fact that the Shogunat stuff feels a bit weird, despite the fact that I'm not sure about the Buddhist monks and Shintoism going that way historically speaking, I just don't know better. I have to say that for that as well as I said earlier. But despite these facts, I'm looking at this and I am so damn excited to really guide my society and have decades where I don't want to wage a war because I am busy shifting the peasants into literacy, into working in, in companies, into weakening the aristocrats, or into, for example, preserving aristocracy, preserving their rights, their power, their privileges. Being busy, doing just that, is something you cannot do anywhere else. I hope DevDaris resume very, very soon, and then that we very, very soon get a release date. I'm going to play Victoria 3, of course, um... At PDXCon, I will be attending PDXCon, I will be playing it there, I will check it out in all its depth, I will let you know. I, I don't think there, there, there couldn't be an NDA, I mean, it's for anybody, right? Anybody that uh, shows up for PDXCon can play it. I will tell you everything about it. And I, I couldn't be more excited. I really hope we're looking at like late September, October maybe. Or release date because man do I want to play this game uh, let me know what you think about this AAR again it ended fairly abruptly here but that is the spirit of AARs I think we saw a lot of features explained I think the next one that we will cover regardless of any other factors is the very recent one in uh, Ethiopia I have to go through that one to see whether there's any interesting information in there that I want to cover because if not then we're not going to do it either way this is it for this video and I will see you later Alligator.